Hey, everybody. I have returned. I know it's been a long time since I've put out an episode, but as you know, I'm in the jungle. And, you know, the great thing about the jungle is that it's the jungle. And it's not so technological, technocrat, uh, metal and steel and internet cables and everything everywhere. It's just, it's just jungle. But, unfortunately, that also means that I'm not able to really do my job as consistently as I'd like to. And I've been, man, I've been really missing putting out these episodes each week. I've been missing sitting down and just recording my thoughts and talking to different people. Uh, But I'm getting so much value from being here. Uh, My time here at the Temple of the Way of Light uh, in the Amazon rainforest in Peru has been just just really incredible, truly amazing. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I I mean, what can I say? I'll probably record some podcasts actually to sort of maybe recap the experience and and just talk a little bit more into more detail because I'm sure a lot of you longtime listeners want to know how my experience is going, what I'm, what I'm experiencing, how are my ayahuasca ceremonies playing out and how my time here is. And I'm going to go into all that. I'm going to, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to record a couple episodes like I did the last time I was here as a guest. And uh, I have a lot of amazing things to say, a lot of really just mind-blowingly spectacular, eye-opening, third-eye-blasting, chakra-electrifying stuff to say. But um, yeah, anyway, keep it kind of short today. Today's podcast is with Chris Killam, the medicine hunter. Um, A lot of people are probably familiar with Chris. He's been kind of a staple of the plant medicine world, the psychedelic world for a while. I mean, he's been in this game for probably longer than I've been alive. Um, And he's really, he's got a lot of uh, of knowledge and wisdom to share. I attended a a talk that he gave the other night called The Shaman's Pharmacy, where it was a sort of a basic introduction to certain kinds of of plant medicines that can be found here in the jungle and also in in the Andes and, and in Peru. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was really great. It's really great to see that sort of thing happening here at the temple, you know, or as I like to call the Hogwarts of the jungle, you know, this sort of magical, uh, <laughs> place where, you know, these, these real wizards, you know, are, are, are performing really just, just magic, um, on like a whole nother level, something to be experienced. Uh, and I do my best at trying to articulate it in, in a way but uh, it's really, truly something to be experienced. Um, what else can I say? Um, you know, I, I've, like I said, I, I, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be releasing some episodes that'll talk more about my experience. Um, I, yeah, and I guess I just want to give a shout out to to people who are new to the show. I think oftentimes I, I communicate uh, to this core audience, you guys, you know, my loyal supporters, my loyal listeners, my compadres, my amigos, my homies, uh, you guys, the, the ones who are you know, responsible for keeping this show going with your support. Uh, you know, it just warms my heart every time, as you know, when I, when I get to connect with you guys. And that's one of the things I'm missing the most is connecting with you guys, talking with you guys, and when you message me and, and we're able to communicate. And um, so I just want to thank you so much for all your support. Thank you for bearing with me during this, this time of, of limited podcasts. Um, you know, some good stuff is coming. And yeah, uh, that's pretty much about it. Uh, we'll, we'll get into this conversation with Chris Killam. It was a really great one. Uh, you know, it was really fantastic. We had uh, Debbie here, our director of operations at the temple slash ringmaster, as I as I mentioned in the show. And, uh, you know, she's wonderful. She's really great. And um, they are actually a part of, she's facilitating a workshop that Chris is a part of uh, where a group of, of women and some men have come together. Uh, they call themselves the, the Cosmic Sisters and they're here at the temple. And so Debbie's facilitating that workshop that Chris is a part of with his wife, Zoe. And towards the end, Debbie wanted to ask some specific questions. So she came in to ask some questions and they were really, uh, really nice questions. And, and Chris really sort of opened up there at the end. So stay tuned for the whole podcast because the end particularly is is really nice i really liked what chris had to say and i really appreciated debbie's questions there at the end so stick around listen to the whole thing and as always guys if you love this show if you enjoy the show if you like hearing content like this if you support the the message and the theme uh that i'm trying to communicate with this show all you got to do is just leave a little 
five-star review on iTunes, a little comment if you like. You don't even have to leave a comment if you don't want to. Um, just uh, click click whatever stars you think I deserve, preferably five. But I'm not pushing your, you know, I'm not pushing you to do anything. Just you know, maybe five stars is good. Five five's a nice good number. <laughs> but seriously, um, you know, the best way to support this show is just talking about it, sharing it, uh, telling your friends, and and uh, spreading the word. And that helps us, uh, you know, get guests like Chris who who dedicate, uh, you know, their time to sitting down and having a conversation with me and and and, uh, you know, spreading his knowledge to to people like you. Um, and, yeah, that's what this is all about, is just sharing and spreading, spreading this this sort of message and theme um, that we that we have going on here at Mike Adelic. So, yeah, if you like the show, if you enjoy it, if you get value out of it, just share it, spread it, like it. You know, leave a comment, leave a review, leave a little five star thing there if you don't mind. And just a huge, major shout out to all the people who've already done that. I love you all very much. And for the people who are donating to me on Patreon, for the people that are, you know, contributing their their hard earned money to help this show keep going, uh, I have more love and gratitude for you than I could even possibly uh, express in words. So thank you so much for doing that. It just means so much to me. And for the people that are new, uh, if you are interested, it's, uh, patreon.com slash Mike Brank, B-R-A-N-C. You can contribute as little as a dollar a month. I don't have any advertisements on this show. Uh, I try and keep it, um, pretty, you know, pretty free, pretty open, pretty raw, unscripted. Most of the interviews I do, it's just uh, unedited, and we put them right out there. And I'm not trying to like push anything on anybody. You know, just just get right to the meat of it. So we rely on donations from people like you. I have PayPal donations available. I have Patreon donations available. You could donate as little as a dollar a month. You know, whatever you want. And if you can't do that, then fine. Just you know, do whatever you can to to support and and help. Uh, you know, places, shows like this to, to keep going. I'm shows like this, I mean, my show. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you to everyone. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's amazing journey down here and I can't wait to share it all with you. Uh, but, uh, for now back to the, back to the jungle. And, uh, I hope you guys really enjoy this conversation. It was, uh, probably one of my favorites, uh, Chris Killam, the medicine hunter. So without further ado, Let's get right to it. Psychedelics are illegal, not because a loving government is concerned that you may jump out of a third-story window. Psychedelics are illegal because they dissolve opinion structures and culturally laid down models of behavior and information processing. They open to us the possibility that everything we know is wrong. We don't need new laws that control our consciousness and rigidly place it in a prison. Cognitive liberty. The fact that as adults, if we're not hurting anybody else, we should have the right to explore the contours of our own consciousness without any mediation or legislation on the part of somebody else. Reject authority. Authority is a lie. Or is it perception? Information is power. But we have to seize, seize the opportunity. The opportunity. The opportunity. Yeah, I'm sitting here in this uh, palatial tambo here at the Temple of the Way of Light from uh, our lovely director of operations slash ringmaster, if you will, of this uh, wonderful, wonderful place with this group of amazing people that are here at the at the temple. Uh, yeah, so lovely to have Debbie here as well. But um, but I'm sitting here with uh, Chris Killam. The, the Medicine Hunter. Thank you so much for, for sitting down with me. It was a lovely talk that you gave the other night, the Shaman's Pharmacy. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really a, an honor and a privilege to sit down with you. I, um, when I came here as a guest, I was doing a little bit of research on like where to go. And funny enough, I came across a video that uh, had you in it. Uh, and uh, you were talking about the temple and, and everything. And so... Uh, I understand this is your second time here. Thank you for coming back. Uh, so yeah, what keeps uh, bringing you back here? 
Well, I think in answer to your question, what keeps bringing me back uh, here to Temple, and and as you said, it really only is my second time, um, but here to Peru and here to ayahuasca and here to the uh, Shipibo shamans is um, the renewal that I get from it. Uh, I maintain, you know, I've been drinking ayahuasca with uh, Shipibo shamans in Peru for about 11 years. And um, I find uh, because I travel the world, because I'm out there constantly in ever-changing scenes and have a lot of demands on me, that I require renewal. And I've found healing from some, some very grave, difficult, you know, nasty, gnarly crap from my earlier uh, life, uh, especially in my first years of drinking. And um, I've also gained inspiration and insight and um, a lot of subtle things that I never expected. So what keeps me coming back is... Um, the ever unfolding process of renewal, inspiration, and healing. You know, it's not as though we arrive someplace and we've got our bag of garbage, and then when we clean that, that's done, because we continue to live. And we're constantly accruing more stresses. We're constantly accruing more, you know, difficult things in life, because life is not easy. And so, just the way that we learn to bathe ourselves to wipe off the grime from the day or the days, uh, I have found that for me, diving into the pool of ayahuasca, especially with very talented shamans, gives me that inner refreshment that enables me to do my work. And I think that the, the way that uh, Temple of the Way of Light is put together is very thoughtful and very considerate of the Pasajeros, and you have marvelous shamans here and great facilitators. And, and I do want to say, I pay attention to the food. I mean, I've scared people off of some centers just by saying, listen, their food's crap and they don't understand it and you don't want to go there. Um, I, I think it's very hard to eliminate as many of the discomforts as possible so that the primary discomfort that people face is, is the inevitable discomfort of ceremony. So for all of those reasons, and probably more that I've failed to articulate, that's why I keep coming back. Yeah, no, I, I, I really, I really did enjoy you. You know, you gave this talk uh, called the, Sha- uh, the shaman's pharmacy, beautiful presentation. You had all of the plant medicines out on the table. Everybody was really attentive. You know, the healers were there. It was really nice. It was really nice to, to have that experience. And, you know, I think maybe, you know, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here if it wasn't for somebody like you, who, you know, is interesting when you're, when you're up there talking and I see the healers to your, to your right or, you know, they're sitting there. It's like, almost like you're acting as this sort of bridge for people like us who don't come from this plant medicine world. And as you mentioned, a lot of the things that we use in the Western world are derived from, from plant medicine. Um, but there's that disconnection, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, just, I guess just to thank you for being sort of like one of the pioneers to, to bring us Western folk over here, uh, to get us interested. Well, that's a kind of a delightful entree to a little bit of a story in, um, I've been doing this medicine hunting work for a living really since, uh, I guess, since the end of 94, even though I was involved in natural products for a long time prior to that. And um, my first time in the Amazon was 1997. And I lived on the, on the Amazon River in Brazil with a group of natives for a month. That was my introduction. And it was, oh, it was marvelous. I mean, it's like a kid in a candy store, you know. And I wanted to go see shamans. And their answer was, their, their question was, well, why do you want to go see shamans? And I said, well, because they know a lot. And they were kind of surprised because they were already removed from it. So I wound up having to rent this gigantic riverboat because every single native person in the entire neighborhood came. And we went out for days meeting these different shamans, all of whom happened to be women. And there was one legendary shaman that we heard about, a woman named Maria Sina. 
and she was 103 years old, and she was the shaman of all the shamans. And and it was one of those comical things where we'd show up someplace, and they go, oh, yeah, man, Maria Cena, she just left. And, you know, where'd she go? Oh, she went to such and such a place. So we'd go to such and such a place, and they go, yeah, man, you missed her by just a couple hours. Or, you know, and this kind of went on and on. We were on this merry chase for this woman. And eventually, we caught up with her. And, uh, you know, when you're 103, life kind of like shrinks you a lot. So she was this little, little old lady, brilliantly clear eyes, vividly clear mind, an amazing spirit to her. You could just feel the amplitude of her energy and her power and her love coming out of her. No wonder she was the shaman of shamans. And she looked at me and she kind of pointed a grandmotherly finger at me and she said, You bridge the world. And she told me how my purpose was to share between people and to have, and to perform that function. We'd not met before that she had no introduction to me. She was just like high and wise and insightful and amazing. And so knew what was going on anyway. Um, and, and I, I really took that to heart. I thought, um, you know, there is so much misunderstanding in the world and, all different people have their own, you know, they have their own world story. They have their own world view. They've got their explanations of how things work. And when you really kind of get behind that, the majority of people want the same thing. They want to be happy. They want to be healthy. They want to be safe. They want opportunity for their children. You know, they want some way to genuinely enjoy themselves. So I really make an effort, and I think sometimes I succeed more than other times, but I make an effort to be an agent for that, to be, as Maria Cena said, a bridge, you know, between worlds. So if I can also have the privilege of having the shamans in the room at the same time that I'm talking with pasajeros, for me, that's that's the best possible scenario. You know, they're giving enormously to me and to us in ceremony and in the work they do you know the the special healing massages the flower baths the good cheer just you know the affectionate hugs along the path and so to be able to also give something back and in a way it kind of is bringing coals to newcastle in a way, you know telling them about the plants that they've grown up with and know so well uh, it's also very gratifying very very satisfying for me that's an awesome story um yeah i'm wondering like so when she said that to you was how did you feel about that was that your first like experience with experiencing something that was sort of unexplainable uh from someone no you know uh i have to say mike that i've been inordinately fortunate and i have no idea why since um the very early gee uh 1970s i've had yogis and mystics and shamans and lamas and you know gifted spiritual people take unusual amounts of time with me to sit me down and to say things along the lines of you know your mission in life is to carry a lot of light or i mean something like that and I, and I never get a sense of, like myself, you know, say disproportionate to other people. It's not about, you know, greatness or that kind of thing. It's about them tuning into a, a mission, a responsibility. You know, we're all, we're all best suitable for something. And so, no, actually, um, by the time I got to Maria Cena, I had heard this a lot. But there was something extra about i mean in a way she she further galvanized that sense of mission and it came at a really critical time when um you know my my career had really taken off so a lot of opportunity was open to me and so i felt well yeah you know this is i mean first of all this kind high wise immensely powerful grandmother is giving me my marching orders so it's like yes ma'am But also I felt that she was completely tuning in to what all those other people had said. And then, of course, continued to say after her, because it has been kind of an endless succession of them. 
Um, so no, it wasn't the first time that I encountered the unexplainable. Uh, it was part of something that's been a theme in my life. And, and, um, that has given me a lot of, uh, juice and a lot of inner strength to go out in the world and to be an advocate for real health and healing, not swallow this pill and you'll get rid of your gas, but, you know, think about the world this way and we together can kind of help heal sort of along the lines of the bodhisattva vow, you know, you know, nobody gets enlightened till everybody gets enlightened. So I think all of these beings have helped me to arrive at a sense that um, true healing involves everybody and everything, and all the rest is symptomatic relief. You mentioned like early on in, in your career, and then I, I think before you talked about some of your uh, stuff from early life that needed to be cleared up. And someone was saying this the other day, I, I forget who mentioned it to me, but they were saying that like we teach what we most desperately need ourselves. Um, so when, when you started off on this journey, maybe you could talk a little bit about that, like sort of what brought you to, to be the medicine hunter, what brought you to this journey and, and how did you get started on all this and what were you maybe, you know, seeking in the beginning and looking for? Well, there are different bits and pieces that come together. Um, my dad was a type one diabetic. So at a very early age from very early childhood, I knew something that most medical doctors didn't know, and that is that diet was critical to health because I could see it with him. It was very evident. And so that was something that was intrinsic to our family life was that what you eat had everything to do with how healthy you could be. And um, I also, in uh, 1967... Uh, I got high for the very first time. I took 250 micrograms of LSD and that was just like, yeah, who buckaroo. And, and my, my, one of the things that happened to me was like, why didn't anybody talk about this? Like they kind of left this great big monstrous cosmic part out. Another piece was that my, uh, grandfather was an astonishing minister. He was, as he liked to say, everybody in my congregation has a different religion. He was this very open ecumenical guy, and he spent his entire life, he and my grandmother, serving people. It wasn't about pounding the pulpit. It was about serving people. So all of that kind of was a beautiful setup, and, and I think one of the things that happened to my friends and me during the late 60s was that it was as though this idea fell upon us. We should all be like meditating, right? Yeah, yeah, we got to learn to meditate. We should all be practicing yoga, right? Yeah, we should all learn to do that. Who knows how to cook brown rice? Okay, I'll figure out how to do that. I'll get a cookbook. And it was kind of on and on and on and on and on like that. And it was not a well-thought-out plan. It was not a clearly articulated path. And then I started going into, um, I lived in the suburbs outside of Boston. So I started going into Boston Chinatown where they had all these apothecaries, all these herbal apothecaries. And I was just like nothing but a nuisance. You know, I'd go in there and make sure I bought a ginseng root just so they wouldn't throw me out. You know, because <laughs> I'd like go and spend time looking at stuff that I had no idea what it was. No idea at all, you know. And then eventually read books and met people who knew about herbs and like went on an herb walk early on with this complete character named Ben Charles Harris, who was like one of those eccentric herbalists that you read about, like kind of kooky and really smart and really wonderful. He had a book called Eat the Weeds. And it just seemed that as, as I was open to this, I kept having these encounters and, and through those encounters, people would pass knowledge and information or give tips that led to other encounters and other knowledge and information and tips. So I, uh, in a way, can take no credit for, you know, or not much credit for winding up here. It was more that kind of a Christmas morning scenario of right place, right time, right culture, and an enormous number of right influences, uh, people who, seeing that I, you know, have certain talents and gifts were very encouraging. Uh, and I think, uh, especially my mom 
It was very hard, I think, for her to be my mother in certain ways because I did things that were so out of her comfort zone, you know, going to sketchy places, spending time where I'd be out of communication for a long time. But she was so fiercely supportive of that. I think that all kind of propelled me forward into this. And understanding and really grasping the true nature of the value of all of this healing, uh, of coming at the world with a sense of gratitude and respect and integration and how everything works together and how all life needs to be supported and no life should be left behind. That was just something that, thanks to all those forces, I wound up coming to understand. It's amazing how, like, I guess some people might say, like, the universe conspires to, to put you in that place and to have these things unfold in the way that they do. And unfortunately, like our mainstream society doesn't necessarily encourage or foster this sort of education. Like you said, with your LSD experience, like, why isn't anybody talking about this? And that's how I felt, too, you know, and especially like, you know, after after the 60s with the whole like, just say no and drugs are bad. This is your brain on drugs and all that stuff. And then sort of growing up, like looking back at the 60s and the people who experienced that sort of thing and like. You guys were like legends. Like, you know, we look at we look at that and we're like, whoa, like that was that was the time when when people were were they grabbed hold of this idea and they were really committed and they were riding it with, with no, you know, no BS attached to it. And they were just committed and and somehow that sort of maybe fizzled out. But now I think we see a little bit of a resurgence of that, but in a totally different framework. Like like what's happening now is like truly amazing i mean it's it's really becoming more present in the in the collective consciousness and more of the mainstream consciousness so you know it's um i think it's in large part to what you were saying about someone being this sort of bridge you know these sort of responsible people to to go out there and and spread the message right um so yeah like maybe you could talk a little bit about like what you see from your first experiences to now and how things are shifting and changing and and you know who's playing a part in that and what's you know what's what's going on what do you see i think as pertains to um let's say psychoactive plants or you know the psychedelics which is a term i like very much cuz it's mind manifesting and i think of that in the buddhist manner that all is mind and so you know, manifesting that pure mind. I think that's one of the one of the things that gets fulfilled with psychedelics. We were not doing them ceremonially. We may have been intentional to the extent that they were like, hey, it's a beautiful day. This is I've got some great acid. Let's go to the beach. Let's have a marvelous time. Remember to bring water, you know, all that. There was in fact that kind of intent, but we did not have um, a sense, a knowledge that many of these agents came from antiquity. I mean, LSD didn't, but, uh, and, that, and that they were also agents of, um, you know, spiritual application. I mean, we got spiritual benefits for sure, uh, and also agents of integration and healing. And we heard little snippets of that, but there wasn't really enough communication about that. So I think one of the fundamental changes, uh, and I don't want to suggest that everybody who's engaged with psychedelics is doing it intentionally for healing, um, but one of the fundamental changes is that now in this information age, and with many more people uh, bringing knowledge from different traditions like the peyote tradition and the use of San Pedro and the Andes and ayahuasca here and iboga from Africa and cannabis, you know, from originally deriving from Siberia and now everywhere in the world. Um, we have a much better sense of how these, these psychedelics or these, these psychoactive agents fit into history, how they are almost certainly the origins of religion, only without the socioeconomic uh, power groups. Um, so I think that the change is immense. 
And also you have a lot of thoughtful, gifted people who are applying themselves from a, you know, from the position as therapists, um, helping folks with traumas that do not resolve with the talking therapies, that do not resolve with Prozac, that do not resolve with so much of what um, has been tried and has failed miserably. Finding, oh, you know, like I, I recently we saw um, the documentary film Becoming Cary Grant. And he had a lot of uh, anger and resentment toward women because his mom left his life early. And he did 100 assisted LSD therapy sessions. And at the end, because he was originally, his name was Archie Leach, you know, and he always really wanted to be Cary Grant. And at the end, he became Cary Grant. He really was able to embody that in a lighthearted, mature, integrated whole way. And um, so I think that the, I think a lot of it, the intentionality, the knowledge base, uh, you know, I taught uh, for 14 years at the University of Massachusetts, of course, the Shaman's Pharmacy. And those students came in knowing vastly more than we knew right off the bat. I mean, just walking in day one. And, and that was a marvelous and wonderful thing for me to go, okay, they're way beyond where we were in many respects. Although, as you pointed out, we really did kick ass in the 60s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's something like... Yeah, that we've we like my generation growing up, like looking back, like man, those were the times. So I think there's this certain like resurgence in wanting us to like recreate that sort of that sort of time. It's just happening in a different way, you know. It's happening in a, in a much different way. Um, yeah, I mean, you uh, you've been all around the world, right? And and you've investigated all different kinds of healing modalities and plant medicines. What was what was the one thing you know it could be at any time that really just sort of blew your mind or or was like wow that was unexpected? Well, I would say um, I mean I, I've encountered a lot of unexpected, and and I just consider that good fortune. Um, early as a medicine hunter, I went to Vanuatu, South Pacific, on behalf of a company that. Um, wanted me to help them to develop a, a large industrial herbal business. And, and it was kind of funny because the, the people who had this said, you know, what's the first thing we should do? And I said, you should develop kava. And they said, what's the first thing we need to do to do that? And I said, you need to pay me a lot of money and send me to the South Pacific. And I kind of held my breath there, you know, and they were like, okay. Um, and when I got there, I wound up completely immersed in native culture very, very, very far removed from, you know, what I grew up with. I mean, I'd been to India and China and other places, and I, and I had, uh, let's see, and I hadn't yet been to the Amazon. That was before the Amazon. But um, I wound up, I'm a kind of a deep dive guy. You know, people do this differently. People have a notion that you remain kind of an outside observer or something. And, and my thing is, if they're barefoot, I'm barefoot. If they're playing with the dog, I'm playing with the dog. If they go to the waterfall, I go to the waterfall. You know, and, and so I wound up in the process of, of working on kava, which I helped to greatly popularize, also going very deep into that culture fire walking with them every year for six years, uh, participating in ceremonial scenes with chiefs that I would never, never have access to, becoming a chief, becoming their diplomat to the U.S. for three years, I mean, and on and on. And, you know, meeting one of the greatest friends of my life, a, a, a prince from Tahiti who lived in Vanuatu, and we became best friends. And, and so I guess the surprises, the kind of surprise you're talking about uh, was finding this entire world in which I was so welcome and so appreciated and able to do so much, you know, I was able to do thankfully monumental work with those people and it revolutionized their economy. It revolutionized their lives a lot, you know, and, and the payoff for me was that it made me lifetime friends. So those are some of the surprises for sure. Yeah. I think that, you know, that's, it's such a better way 
to get what we want in the world, to travel to other places, sit with other people, learn about them. They're willing to share with us if we're willing to be open and share with them. It's such a beautiful way of, of existing. And then, you know, everybody walks away with with something of value, you know, mutually, you know, and, the, and there's this sort of mentality that's been going on forever, right? Of sort of marching around the world and dominating other cultures and, uh, and, and oppressing people and extracting things and not taking it, you know, not giving back. And, you know, in, in the end, I mean, that just le- leads to, to more ruin and more destruction. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, 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 this idea that we sort of have, and when I say we, I'm referring to like sort of the mainstream uh, power dynamic that's in the world right now. Okay, like, you know, this ayahuasca stuff is great. Let's, can we extract it and make a new pill, And we'll just give it to people and that, yeah. It, but you're missing the whole, like what you're talking about, this, the culture, sitting with the people, traveling to another place. How, how important do you, do you see that aspect of, you know, this, we're here now. I mean, I wouldn't want to be any, any other place in the world right now than here. I mean, this beautiful jungle and these people here, it's truly incredible. Well, look, this is our life. This is our precious life. We don't have anything else. So the question is qualitatively, what's the life you want? Do you want to spend your life collecting a lot of shit and, you know, going after, just going after money and, um, you know, stepping over people along the way and dominating them to get what you want? I mean, uh, that's not the life I want. When I go to a country, the one thing I am not, I am not the expert. I come to your country, I may be able to bring you something of value, like, hey, I could help you to connect to trade and and perhaps help to keep, you know, let your community thrive and prosper better. And it would be my great pleasure to do that if that's something you want and only if that's something you want. And only if we can work it out in an equitable way that you don't feel like you're being taken advantage of and it doesn't trash this beautiful environment you're in. But it's really, you know, what is the life you want? I want friends. I want to love people, you know. I want to go to places and, you know, like be surrounded by, you know, whoever it is and and laugh during the day and go it doesn't get better than this there there are always these times when i'm out on the the trail as i like to call it when <clears throat> you know I, it's often i'll be in a boat or a truck with a bunch of guys and i'll just burst out laughing and they'll go what's up and i'll go i'm working right now and usually they get the joke cuz we're having so much fun you know i mean it's purposeful fun but it's it's fun you know and um, they're like, yeah, man, right, you know, you're working. And, and I, I think it's, we're taught these foolish, um, heartless, wrong-headed ways to be. Why would you want to dominate people? Have an affiliation, have friendships, have love, you know, um, enjoy this process. And, and I'm not suggesting that I live in a, you know, a competition free universe and that I don't have to navigate through that. But for example, I personally, I won't compete with anybody. I don't care who they are. The, you know, I mean, I, I have people in the, uh, the field of ethnobotany who I know some of them wish that they had some of the opportunities that I have. But I'm not competing with them. I don't want to compete. I don't want to dominate. I want to affiliate. I want to find those openings of love and friendship. And in that whole process, work on something that, you know, my wife and I talk about this a lot. My theory is it's good and worthy and sufficient to help some people for some of the time in some ways. I'm not going to save the world. You're not going to save the world. So-and-so is not going to save the world. That's an unrealistic, crazy, messianic delusion, okay? But if we can make a difference, if we can have some sort of positive impact in people's lives and affect that, in my case, through 
medicinal plants, through bringing healing agents to the market, through bringing things that maybe we don't have access to, say, in the U.S. and Europe, but you have access to in the Amazon. And at the same time, contribute in some sort of, you know, humane, kind way that supports people not having to go to the city and become moto drivers or chambermaids in somebody's nightmare, then that's the pleasure of it. That's the purpose of it. It's not to come back and say, man, I'm going to make 20 million bucks on this. And, you know, and I didn't have to pay those people anything. You know, I could just get, get this for pennies. I'm always the guy in the chain, much to the annoyance of my clients saying, you got to pay these people more. And when the clients object, I say, okay, you go back there and make the arrangements. And of course that ends that because they're never going to go there. They're not going to go to Congo. They're not going to come to the Amazon. They're not going to go to all these places I go to. And so in that way, you know, I get to use a little bit of aggression to say, no, it's going to be more fair than that. And you're going to make money anyway. You're going to make way more money they're ever going to make. So you pay them. And so that's all part of the, and there's a little bit of wandering around the landscape in that answer, but that's how I think about this work. Yeah, no, I'm glad you wandered around the landscape because there's so much there. And, and it really is amazing because, you, you know, I think for the, for the average person, if they're hearing shamans in the Amazon or something like that, right, they're, they're thinking this sort of like, you know, really far away, distant thing. And these people must, they, they don't know what cell phones are. Or, you know, they're just, they're, who knows where their minds are going, right? But we live in this modern world. And like you said, and I think you mentioned it in your talk, like because uh, this, this field was sort of like dying, a lot of these people weren't training to become healers. They weren't training. And it, it you know, that just makes me think it's like, it's not only does, is, is it their tribe and their community that, that suffers, but the, the world at, at large, because there's this ripple effect, you know, this, this, we have this need as human beings, and we've always had this need, as you mentioned, saying this goes back ancient times, to connect with plants, to connect with, with things that, that alter our consciousness, to connect us to some sort of greater thing, or connect us, bring us inside into ourselves to, to discover some, some much needed healing in order to coexist so we're not dominating, so we're not doing these sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, what have you seen throughout your years of, of going around the world and, and investigating different medicines and coming here to the Amazon in terms of uh, the, the, the indigenous groups and, and how they're now responding to uh, the greater interest in, in this field? Well, this is the unhappy part of the story. Um, you know, indigenous people all over the world are on the ropes. They're being marginalized. Uh, they're being shot. They're being run off their land. They're being poisoned. They're being driven into the cities. They're being starved out. Um, I want to, I mean, on the one hand, in my heart, I'd like to be able to say, I'm seeing all this good stuff. I'm not seeing all this good stuff. Um, You know, I think it was Gandhi, though I'm not sure, who said, you must proceed as though you make a difference. Um, What I see is a world in shambles, grossly overpopulated, obsessively overpolluted, uh, people striving for the wrong stuff, you know, give me more stuff, 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 rather than, wow, you know, like, give me more time with my niece, you know, or whatever it is. And and so I think that, um, I mean, you know, there are very few populations of people now that don't know cell phones. Although a couple of years ago, I had the experience of um, going into a fairly far away mountainous region of Sichuan, China, where I've done a lot of work in China over the years. And I did get to communities where they had not ever had foreigners. In fact, my friends and I got to a modern hotel in a small city and they had never once had a foreigner. They didn't know what to do. They called the police and the police came and they didn't know what to do. So they just kept like, uh, Xeroxing our our uh, documents over and over again until finally I just pointed a finger at a policeman. I said, "Give that back to me. You've you you photocopied that enough, you know." But um, and then going up into the hills, we stopped in a, a small town, 
and I got out of the truck. There was a school there, and I walked into the classroom, and the teacher just, the, this woman teacher who was very sweet, just threw her arms up in the air because she knew school was over, you know. And then the others I was with came in, and we spent the entire afternoon photographing the kids and watching their parents uh, preparing tobacco in this square and going into people's homes because everybody was proud of their homes and wanted to show us their homes. And um, so in, in terms, and, and yeah, they all had cell phones. So, you know, they were all taking photos like mad while we were taking photos like mad. But um, what I do see is people who don't have the, the strength and the power of strong economics uh, being cast aside for phony values, for things that are worthless, you know, for petroleum, for gold. Who gives a shit about gold? You know, to cut down the timber instead of respecting the wildlife and the grandeur of nature. Uh, you know, to clear cut vast, vast, vast tracts of rainforest so that we can have more beef. We don't need more beef. And it's, it's very hard on the one hand to have a positive attitude and to find the openings to do good work and at the same time see the devastation because the devastation is real. It's ongoing. There was a recent uh, study by two environmental scientists who proposed that we are already past the tipping point with the Amazon that it is no longer retrievable, that the damage has been so great that we're in the, you know, the waning years of this. And, you know, it's not just an ecosystem. This is people's homes. Uh, so, so in answer to your question, what do I see with indigenous people? I see suffering. I see neglect. I see marginalization. I see deliberate persecution and death. You know, get these frickin' people out of the way so we can drill. Instead of, stop the drilling. There are human beings and animals and nature here to care for. What were we thinking? And maybe we weren't thinking, right? I think that's a large part of it. There's no thinking. It's just this sort of weird drive, this, like, you know, treadmill or whatever that everybody's on to get to this race, to get to this thing that, I don't know, it never seems to manifest. So I could imagine like some people hearing this right now and just being like, fuck. I mean, I'm sort of feeling like that a little bit. Like, so like, what, what can we do? Well, one of the things we can do, and this is not my idea, but we can vote with our pocketbooks. You know, if you don't like Monsanto and you don't like GMOs, don't buy them. Stop buying those non-organic corn chips just because they're cheaper. Stop. Stop buying that canola oil. Stop it. You know, buy virgin olive oil. Stop, stop giving these people the power and the fuel that they need to hold swords over the heads of most of humanity. Uh, you know, we have in the United States, for example, an absolutely unacceptable thing going on right now with the political system. And I would not say that the Democrats are holy and the Republicans are evil. I would, I kind of look at them and say, you know, they're all venal and greedy and they're all just like sucking up as much pork gravy as they can hold for the time they're going to be there. And, you know, vote these people out. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, sort of a kind of a, some people kind of wanting to bring back the times of the 60s in a way. No, you don't. We had the war in Vietnam. We had, um, you know, a very, very high intensity time of the civil rights movement uh, where a lot of people were being hurt and beaten. I mean, and that's not a resolved issue, um, but it was as much a time of strife as it was of joyful revolution. Um, but I would say that if more people can get more fully how our participation in the world can either positively influence or adversely affect others. Um, you know, as Krishnamurti said, the only revolution is within. You can go do this or that. You can go, you know, you have to transform your own consciousness to get that there is no separation. There is no you and me. 
the us is one thing. And as long as the the established order teachings, these phony religions that have persisted through time, as long as they are all about dividing, conquering, separating, separating, making people feel guilt, fear, and shame, you know, and desperate for something, but don't worry because even though you're suffering like mad now and you, we're, you know, hoovering money out of your pockets to make ourselves rich, you're going to be rewarded in heaven. If we can get past that garbage thinking to something that is real, then I think that's part of the answer. And, and, and I also think at the same time that many people are so sincere in their heartfelt desire to help to change the world, that their inclination is to want to do more than is realistic for the individual. There are no messiahs. There just aren't. There never have been. Either we all are the messiah, either we all save the world, or we all go down together. And it's nobody's personal obligation to assume the burdens of hundreds of millions or billions of people besides the fact that it cannot be accomplished. I mean, you may have these beautiful lights that come periodically in history, you know, people who are astonishing in so many ways who, you know, whether it's a Dr. Martin Luther King or whoever, who provide a lot of guidance and inspiration to others. But if he didn't have the thousands and thousands of people marching with him, he'd be a preacher in a church, okay? Just reaching that congregation, which is not a bad thing. But we we have to, at the same time, accept the responsibility for being change agents without accepting the burden of imagining that it's up to any one of us to do it all, when it's really up to us collectively, all of us, to do it all. Yeah, yeah. No, that was great. I mean, and and, and it's, it's sort of this personal responsibility, right? To sort of like do your part. And I'm a big fan of what you said, voting with your dollar. I had um, John Perkins on the show, author of Confessions of an Economic Hitman. And he, he brought that up as saying that's probably one of the most important things. And, you know, also like writing letters to these corporations who are, you know, telling them like, hey, listen, like I'm a fan of your product, but I don't like what you're doing in the world. I don't like, um, another guest I had uh, on the show, Kyle Tierman is a professional surfer and he has a show called Surfer Change. He uh, found out that Bank of America, his bank was actually funding these like big oil drilling operations in the Amazon. So when he found that out, he, he tried to convince as many people as possible to get their money out of the banks. So yeah, doing stuff like that is you know, it's tremendously important. You may not realize it. You think, oh, I'm just one person, but it adds up, right? And, and you, you know, I think you brought this up in your talk the other night, and I want to talk a little bit about this, which is maybe, you know, maybe some people have this attitude of, and I I think I've seen this, you know, if you go to like Whole Foods and they're like, hey, you want to donate a dollar to save the rainforest or something? And okay, it's a sort of like passive, I think what gets, what's called a slacktivism. You know, it's kind of an easy way out to, to put your money somewhere, but you, you don't necessarily know where that money's going. You don't know what these companies are doing, just like the banks. Like you put your money in the bank, it's easy and convenient to have Bank of America, Chase or whatever, but you have no idea what they're doing with that, with that money. Um, so yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe you could just mention a little bit about that, like elaborate on that. Cause when you brought that up, I thought it was really interesting. It's like, oh my God, like, you know, even, even these so-called, these companies that say that they're helping aren't really helping. Well, not everybody is in a position that they can um, say, you know, go to a foreign place and work with Native people or, or, or do that. I mean, you know, everybody's living their life. People have responsibilities and obligations. And, you know, a lot of people have kids and jobs and things that they can't necessarily abandon for a higher mission. I mean, I mean in fact, people do exactly that from time to time. People say, hey, I was a whatever, a Wall Street broker, I was a this, I was a that, and I left that, and now I'm doing this, you know, more important, valuable service work. But I think, and, I, and I'm and i not so, um, I don't so readily diss, you know, the, the slacktivism thing. I mean, I think, you know, for example, if Whole Foods, and I know a lot about that because I was an executive in what became Whole Foods, you know, I mean, I think if, if, some dollars and proceeds go to good com- community works. Um, that's an honorable thing. Um, 
but at the same time, um, kind of circles back to what's happening here at Temple of the Way of Light and at other places like this. Um, people come here, uh, almost everybody's burdened by some sort of traumas, disappointments, pains, things that have happened in life that have been unhappy, that have held them back somehow. And when people can make healing breakthroughs, and especially like with this group of people we have now where everybody's so supportive of each other, you know, these people didn't know each other before they came. Um, then I think that that um, being freed of some of those burdens is very much uh, like what a lot of us experienced in the 60s with, you know, taking LSD. This just some things automatically make sense. Whoa, I should be taking care of myself better. I, you know, I shouldn't be doing these pharmaceuticals. The, you know, I'd been taking this pharmaceutical for depression and I'm just depressed. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I think there are realizations that come through this process of healing that enable us to go back in the world and in thousands of our interactions, you know, maybe be kinder people, maybe say something that helps to point others toward more purpose, purpose, purposeful, purposeful activities and, and, and also acts for us to engage ourselves in more positively purposeful ways. I mean, I think really, I, I heard a, a Hawaiian elder say a beautiful thing. He said that true healing puts into order the body, mind, and spirit with the past, the present, and the future. And if you really think about the implications of that, you know what it leaves out? Nothing. Nothing at all. And so if we can have those kinds of thorough healings or, you know, eventful times that, that advance us further in terms of being more integrated in that way, then I think we develop a greater intelligence for seeking out the, you know, that's our being, than the doing I think it gives us a greater sense of the doing that is in alignment with that. You know, if you're working in a circumstance in which you know people are just getting screwed up, down, and sideways, after doing this, you may say, you know, I got to leave that and go do something that's better, that's more suitable to my heart. So that kind of gets back to the inner revolution, that the, the really the only revolution is within and if we can revolutionize within ourselves, then whether we're working with medicinal plants, we're working with yoga, we're a chef in a restaurant, we're a teacher in a school, whatever we are, we can engage ourselves in a manner that fosters and supports and nourishes and encourages that same sense of wholeness rather than the same sense of alienation, which is kind of the fundamental diet of society today. Yeah, that's kind of the split between like this pharmaceutical monster in the world versus this plant medicine healing modality of the indigenous that they're sharing with us. And, you know, the, so you have all of these substances, right? Um, and you, meant, you had mentioned like LSD. And I remember someone asked me at like, uh, I think it was at Horizons, uh, Horizons in New York. They were like, I was telling them about ayahuasca. They, oh, no, I never drank ayahuasca, uh, but I've done LSD. How much stronger is it than LSD? <laughs> and I was like, well, it's not really on that scale. It's kind of different. So in your opinion, what, what is ayahuasca to you? Well, ayahuasca is this marvelous discovery, you know, that was made a long time ago. We don't even know how long ago. Um, that. I mean, I think I, I kind of grandfather LSD into one of the greatest things that's ever happened to society. I really do. I think that it's time of arrival. Uh, I mean, in terms of its popularization, was almost impeccable. Uh, it turned millions of us on. Uh, it did extraordinary things for us. So I, I don't, I don't have a diminished sense of it because it originated from Sandoz Labs. I think it was almost like a gift from the gods. But I think that ayahuasca, um, you know, and when I say ayahuasca, I don't mean the liquid. I mean 
the whole application of it in an intentional ceremonial setting with with guides who are trained and talented and experienced and have you know methods and capacity to help people with their own healing i think it is one of the greatest things i've ever encountered um you know i have a a daily practice of yoga that i've maintained for 48 years and i feel that ayahuasca is a beautiful complement to that you know, I'm practicing yoga daily and making my gains and meditating with my wife Zoe and doing all that. And then periodically there are these periods of immense, intense immersion. And the thoroughness, the saturation of understanding that happens with ayahuasca is really something extraordinary. I can tell you something about yourself or you can experience something about yourself in your daily life, a realization, whatever. When you have that realization uh, in an ayahuasca ceremony, the thoroughness, it doesn't leave out your toenails, okay? It, it, it's the all of you. And so I think that ayahuasca is this remarkable gift. And I also think that it is, it's beautiful for the way that, um, as, as you know, we were talking about earlier, that it has helped to be a revival of shamanism, which really was dying out in a terrible and awful and pathetic way. Because people say, why do, why do I want to stay in the jungle and learn from my grandmother? I'm just going to be poor and desperate. And I see my friends, you know, driving taxis in the city who have more than I do, whatever the flat screen TV or something, the Nikes, whatever it is. Um, so I, I think that it is uh, an intercultural bridge that's fostering understanding in both directions. Um, you know, I mean, I know that people can come drink ayahuasca as consumers. Okay. I'm going to go get that and I'm going to have that experience. And then I got this cred and then I can tell my friends and it's like, wow, you're brave, adventurous. But I think the people who, who approach it with sincerity, uh, especially in an environment like here at Temple where the healers are accessible, you know, they're not just the rock stars that show up on stage for the show and split. They're around during the day. They're giving you floral baths. So, you know, they're giving you massages that may be comfortable or uncomfortable, but they're giving them to you. And you're having that exchange. You know, um, this is all part of real healing. All part of real healing. So I, I think that ayahuasca, in that sense, is um, is more grand than LSD. It also being so nature based, being so plant based. You know we're learning, we're naturally taken into the energetic and the whole field of life that is the forest and that is the plants. And that naturally engenders in a lot of people a greater sense of respect and appreciation for the nature. And what can I do to help that? You know, and it might be as simple as, you know, I could grow a home garden organically. I could do any number of things. Uh, so I, I think that it, it's integrating properties personally and also socially and environmentally are greater than LSD for sure. Cool. Yeah. And just for the record, obviously everyone on this show knows how much I love LSD. <laughs> it was the thing that kind of turned me on and, and brought and brought me on this path. Um, so yeah, shout out to LSD. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we're 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 heading up on on about an hour now, and once again, thanks so much for your time. Uh, I wanna I wanna just ask you, like, you know, we covered a lot of ground here, and you know, we're talking about plant medicine, and we're talking about culture, and we're talking about you know, these sort of these big ideas, right? In this sort of like change the world sort of theme, in which I love so much, but I, and I agree with what you said, and you know, that it happens within. What what uh, what do you see uh, for for the future? You know, sort of where we are now. And what's to come? What are maybe some of your hopes or or your vision of what you'd like to see happen? What I see and what I hope to see, Mike, are two different things. What I see is continued polarization and strife between people. Uh, I, I witness a lot of people waking up to the principles and notions that we've been discussing. And I also uh, witness a galvanization of the dominator power bases all over the world, this oppressive military, you know, idea, you know, I mean, 
we all in the 60s we had enough nuclear weapons to blow up the planet and we're like still developing new ones that it'll be more powerful like like how more powerful than blowing the planet to smithereens like what else do you need you, know, you want to blow up the sun too so on the one hand i see uh this tremendous division between people who are arriving at a you know like a greater sense of women's rights for example you know we had a good a good surge of that in the in the 70s but now it's even more inclusive and more embracing and uh more thorough in terms of what what we're imagining uh is 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 right and proper and i think um in terms of the environment, you know, you have the petroleum companies merrily destroying everything in sight and the mining companies doing the same and the GMO crops or the GMO craps, as I like to call them. And on the other hand, more people saying, no, you know, if we, if we farm sustainably and we do it organically, then we save the soil and the air and the water and the wildlife and the health of the people and the health and the farm workers. And isn't that what it's really about? Uh, so, so, I'm experiencing simultaneously the galvanization of these polarized forces. It's very obvious that in terms of social power, the the dark forces, if you will, you know, the forces of Sauron, if you want to go kind of with the Hobbit, you know, metaphor, are they're very, very strong. Very strong. And at the same time, there's this, I am encouraged by the, the hopefulness and the clarity and the communication and the determination and the sense of purpose that I think is um, growing greater among people who want a better world. And I'm on that side. Uh, I'm on the side of, hey, you know, let's, let's push the light. Let's push the everybody wins, not, hey, you know, just I win and screw you. Um, so where it's going to end or how it's going to end, you know, is it going to, as, as, uh, Terrence McKenna said, you know, is it going to end with the vision of Edward Teller, you know, with the nuclear mushroom cloud, or is it going to end with people finding a, a better, more wholesome way to get along with each other on a, a planet that is very, very fragile? Yeah. I'd like to think the latter. Right. And it's like, it, it, you can't help but think that when you're in a place like this, you see it happening right in front of your eyes. So let's let's be hopeful, yeah. And thank you so much for for all your work and everything that you've done. Um, I I just want to see if you have some questions you'd like to ask while you're here. Um, maybe some some things that. Uh, yeah, would you like to sit down and ask some questions? All right. We'll have you sit down and ask some questions. This is our our operations director, ringmaster, wonderful Debbie is going to sit down to ask some questions for Chris. Here you go. Firstly, it's been so amazing having you with us. Yeah, I remember when you were here four years ago. It was a very special connection, and it's taken four bloody years to get you back here. <laughs> yeah, and we've had an amazing workshop. Um, just to talk about, maybe you want to explain a bit about what's been happening since you've been here and what, what's brought you back here and how that experience has been for you. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and I want to say, because I get this opportunity, that I think that you and the the staff and the healers that here conduct this whole venture with such dignity and grace that it really does encourage the healing that people come for. Um, my wife, Zoe Helena, who um, has uh, developed this group called Cosmic Sister, has, she's done the work. You know, I get to kind of, <laughs> it's funny, you know, I sort of get to come along as the medicine hunter, you know, and everybody's going, yeah, the medicine hunter's going to be with us. But she's put this all together. The group of people, these uh, mostly women, although there are a couple of guys, um, and, you know, people with real needs to heal. I mean, you know, not light stuff, some intense traumas, uh, things that have prevented them from being happy or fulfilled or satisfied or able to move forward in their lives. And she has very thoughtfully over the months, and believe me, I've heard a about this endlessly at home, <laughs> you know, at times when I really want to, and at times when it's just like a little bit too much, like, yeah, you told me her story like four times anyway, I got it. You know, I know what's happening there, but she's done this heroic work putting together these women and, um, temple. I, I think that, that the, all of you and Matthew who founded this place have been phenomenal in, 
you know, it's not exactly like we're an invading force, but, you know, allowing us to come in and basically be the entire ceremony. You know, we're not sharing this with additional pasajeros coming from wherever Spain or Switzerland or, you know, any place. We kind of like have the whole house. Um, what has taken place uh, during the week here and the four ceremonies and with the healers and with you facilitators and staff, you know, even just the people who like stand at the doors at night. So when you're going to the baño, you don't go tumbling ass over teacup down the stairs to a piece of concrete, but, you know, really helping people in and out. You've allowed and encouraged and supported in, in all kinds of ways, um, people to go through their own healing processes. And virtually everybody has had some sort of significant breakthrough or breakthroughs. And I know that's a term that gets used a lot, but I mean, you know, people who've come realizing, God, you know, I had sexual abuse as a kid and, and it really messed me up and it made me feel like I'm not lovable and, and, you know, suspicious of uh, men and, and on and on and on and on and on stuff like that. And coming to a place where they're able to, you never forget these things. This is not amnesia, but to move beyond that the way you might move beyond a broken leg, that you can walk again, you can be functional, you can, you can walk in the world, you know, you can continue on your path. Uh, so what I've seen and experienced here not only is the, you know, some of the fulfillment of Zoe's work, which I admire and appreciate and I'm very, very happy for, um, but the way that this group has come together to support each other. And, I mean, they've shared some stuff that, I mean, God, I don't know if I'd gone through that. I'm not sure that I'd be as honest, frankly, as they've been, just sharing, pouring their hearts about it, things that are really hard to communicate in some cases. Uh, and the healers approaching them with, you know, love and respect and tremendous talent and capacity, uh, making sure that in the medicine space, every single person gets treated, you know, with equal love and care and skill so that they get what they need. Uh, it's been, it's been very humbling and, and wonderful. I, I, I don't know. I, I can't, except for maybe like the, a little bit of rain coming through the roof of our tombo. I can't say that I would like have ever asked for anything more. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then just listening to, you know, this amazing conversation that you and Mike have had, um, you know, for me personally, as a, a voice that speaks for what it is that we try and do here at the temple, it's quite interesting. Um, to kind of see that there are many themes that you've touched on, both from the perspective of what's happening globally and what the world is needing to the, the work with plants and where that sits within that world and potentially part of the healing of that world. Um, and then something very important in terms that that's all kind of framed a lot of what it is that we're intending to do here, if that makes sense. And just, yeah, a couple of words about that in terms of how are we doing in the context of all of these things that you guys have actually beautifully been speaking about. Well, I mean, you're, you're simultaneously working in the Amazon, which is, is a place that no matter who you are and what you are is going to, is going to rot everything in sight. So I think that just that challenge, just that environmental challenge, it's amazing that you can kind of still, you know, keep things going. Frankly, I think that the work you do in communities, you know, making sure that, the local people are included, making sure that you're, you know, working on education and, and purposeful programs that, that help beyond the pasajeros who come here who, you know, do get tremendous benefits. Um, I, I think that's, that shows this, the consciousness that this place is guided by. And in terms of the how you're doing, I mean, this is the wild frontiers of the mind and heart, you know. Um, and I think to navigate all of that with people who show up that you never met before, in most cases, I mean, you met us, you know, Zoe and me, but to meet these people and to have a brief period of time in which they're going to uh, declare 
some often some awful, gnarly, incredibly painful stuff and then work through it in ways that they go out feeling more whole and capable and satisfied and equipped to, to you know, work in the world. I mean, you know, if, if you want a grade, A. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been an absolute delight having you guys here. Um, and particularly with this group, because there's a piece of this that is about, um, you know, Mike's question about what do we do? How do we make a change here? And, you know, a lot of the women that have been in this group are change makers, actually. Um, so really just to acknowledge them for what it is that they do. And also there's a link here with what it is that you were speaking about in terms of what's needed to help people, how you yourself have received the, the support and, and uh, rejuvenation that you need to go out there and keep doing your work as a bridge keeper. Um, that these women as change makers in various ways, shapes and forms are receiving that as well, hopefully. Um, so yeah, just a, a bit of a comment in terms of that, how the plant world, what we're doing, how we're doing that, there is really potentially going out there. Well, here's what I think, Deb. I think that, I mean, I had a good experience uh, after my first ayahuasca experience. Another place, another shaman who was spectacular. Uh, you know, I got over the grief of my mother's death. And I was back at Thanksgiving with my family. You know, they're not into this kind of thing at all. This is very alien to them. And my uncle likes to sit and say, and so how has your year been? You know, kind of going around the table, you know, and, and Carolyn, what did you do this year? And hey, Suzanne, what did Doug? And what, you know, kind of like, kind of like gives everybody the opportunity to say whatever bit they're going to say. And so when I, when it got to me, I said, well, you know, I went down to the Amazon and I drank this psychedelic stuff and, and got over the, uh, you know, the grief of mom's death. And there was this kind of like momentary pause. And then everybody said, God, isn't that wonderful? And what I think is that it may not be the case for everybody, but I think that when you can have an experience like this, uh, and and I would say in in some respects you, you get a similar effect to, say, going on a long, deep meditation retreat, maybe without the throwing up. Um, But when you... When you go back out into the world, people notice. People say, oh, you you seem happier. You look brighter. And and that, you know, we're not going to go out and save the world. But if we can go out and be the change, and if we can demonstrate that in our being, not by pushing some sort of an idea, not by demanding that people do any particular thing. But if we can just show that, what I've found is that people say, what have you been up to? And then when I tell them, they say, God, maybe that's something I'd want to do sometime. And I've had a a lot of people in the maybe that's something I'd want to do sometime come down with me over the years and experience that. So that's all by way of saying that I think there is this broadcasting effect when you send the Pasajeros back out into Brooklyn, New York, Miami, Florida, the boonies of Indiana, wherever it is, and they go back into their communities and among their families. I think that there are probably many of people who go, wow, what's she up to? It, lo- it looks like, it feels like, it smells like something I might want in my life. So I think there's an effect that goes, you know, the analogy of the pebble in the pond and the ripples that go out, uh, the Doppler effect of a siren, you know, you know, the way that happens. Um, I think there is a reverberative effect that goes far beyond this central location in a you know, a place in the Amazon to all parts of the world. And and isn't that what we want, is to be able to kind of stream out there in all directions and have a positive effect. Anything you'd like to add or any comments that you'd like to do to to share to wrap all of this up? A lot of people uh, come to the sense that they can't be helped. Um. They're too hurt, they're too damaged, they're too ashamed, they're too afraid, they're whatever. And 
Um, I would say that uh, this particular engagement, which I don't think is right for everybody, by the way. I mean, if you think that ayahuasca is not right for you, I always like to say that's your best advice. Um, but I think that there is hope. I think there is the promise of healing, the real promise of healing. Um, you know, beyond the fumbled attempts of the psychotherapists and the drug companies and, and all just sort of like all the toxic approaches that do not work and cannot work because they're based on completely false assumptions. Um, I think that there is hope and healing to be gained here at Temple of the Way of Light and, and at other good centers too. I want to give a, you know, acknowledge fine people all over doing good work. Um, and I would encourage anybody who feels like, yeah, you know, that maybe that would be right for me to summon the bravery to come and do this. Um, the worst thing that can happen is you don't get the effect you seek, which is the least of what I see. I think the best thing that can happen (sighs) is that you get more than you ever hoped for. Thank you so much. You're pretty moved right now. What's going on? I don't get um I don't get moved by sad stuff. I get moved by happy stuff. For example, it's very hard for me to talk about my grand grandmother because she was so um magnificently loving and I'm a great communicator about the bad stuff. I can just get up there and hammer away at it, you know. And the joyful stuff just kind of like, it gets to me. It really gets to me. And I don't mind that at all. I love you, man. You know, um, everybody needs hope. Everybody needs something to turn to. Everybody needs something that can, uh, they can direct themselves to past their pain. Everybody's got pain. I hear some of the pain that people go through here, and I think, I honestly don't know if I could live through that. I'm amazed. Um, And it's not just hope. It's not just an idea. You see real healing, that whole notion of, you know, Uh, putting into order the body, mind, and spirit with the past, present, and future. You know, finding ways to move forward so that you can have the kind of fulfilling life that I personally believe absolutely everybody deserves. And that you do this work to make that happen. And I don't want to suggest that all of it's perfect, because nobody's perfect, because if we were perfect, we wouldn't be here. But I think that it's so noble and so dignified and so effective that people should know that this option exists. And, you know, as a medicine hunter or as the medicine hunter or whatever, you know, however you want to think about it, um, this is one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time advocating out in the world uh, because, you know, I believe in healing. I believe in every, just like I believe everybody has a right to eat and everybody has a right to safety. I believe that everybody has a right to be healed. And this is certainly one profound and powerful way that people can have that. And I like that hope and the promise and the fulfillment of it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, look forward to having you back again soon. Yeah, that was that was excellent. Thank you so much for your questions, um, Chris. Yeah, you've been awesome, man. Thank you again. And just to, I guess you know, tell people where they could find you and 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 follow your work and everything. Yeah, drop into medicinehunter dot com. Um, it's it, if anything, the site is too big. There's too much there, but you'll find um, you know information about me, information about my wife Zoe, uh, lots and lots and lots of material, but material about medicinal plants, um, lots of photographs of places from around the world, and, um, and links to good information too. So if I can uh, in any way uh, inspire you through that to visit the, the world of medicine hunting, uh, I'll feel kind of like job well done. Awesome. Thanks again so much. It's a pleasure. I hope you guys enjoyed that podcast as much as I did. You know what to do if you love this show. Share it, like it, spread it with your friends, tell a friend, tell a family member, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker, 
And uh, if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash Mike Brank. You can donate as little as a dollar a month. Or you could go on iTunes and leave me a nice five-star rating and review. Whatever you do, thank you for listening. Much love to you all. Peace. Thank you.